Um, Evan Thomas is a fabulous author and has captured the spirit of this these times in a, probably the most gripping of ways. We've asked him to take the lead here. Evan, can I turn it over to you? You bet. Thanks. Uh, uh, David's wonderful speech begs the question, shouts the question of when, when do leaders, particularly military leaders in a civilian controlled system, uh, disagree, dissent, challenge, higher authority? Uh, I want to ask that of, of each of the group, but let me first let me sh start with you, Admiral Mullen. Uh, could Arlie Burke survive today? <laughs> I guess uh, in the way David captures him so well, I would say he'd have figured out a way to do it. Um, given the those that he routinely challenged and the description, I think of. Uh, the word interesting and how he would draw individuals in even as they got mad and even at that level and clearly want to hear from them again. So I, I suspect he could um, uh, and that he would have figured out a way to adjust to the circumstances that, that uh, exist today and, and very much so. But can you, can you address the larger question of, of when, particularly a, a military officer in a civilian control system, uh, when and how and under what circumstances, what are the rules of the road on, on challenging higher authority and dissenting? Well, I think, uh, I, actually, I think uh, not unlike what, uh, what uh, Admiral Burke did in the sense that, that uh, in discussions uh, that are, would be routine with your boss, your civilian boss, uh, and then those that you could, uh, when you, when you uh, disagree and feel strongly about it, even as uh, we can now, right up to the president, not, and it's not just me, even though I have routinely more access to the president than the other chiefs, but certainly they have, they have the option, and uh, that it's done privately, uh, and it's done in a way that, that uh, uh, I think in a timely fashion, if you will, um, and, uh, and that you have a president. You know, I, 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 the other examples I think that uh, are there tied to what David's talking about is you had senior individuals who wanted to listen. Uh, presidents, senior officers, even if it maddened them, they were, they were also willing to listen. And I think that's an important for anybody in any senior position, military and civilian, that you want to listen and having that opportunity to give that advice and then uh, as was the case in a couple of examples he didn't win them all and I'm sure that he uh, marched off and did whatever the you know whatever the <coughs> senior civilian leadership said and that's what we do now and so that uh, both opportunity certainly I have it I had it with President Bush I have it with President Obama uh, and uh, I think uh, it's a very important part of our system, an opportunity to do that, and then when the president makes a decision, we're off. Admiral Ruffhead, let me just pick up with the last first. What's the line when you don't go any farther? How do you know when you're supposed to salute and keep going? What's that moment? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, the, uh, I, I really think that um, uh, as you have uh, thought the problem through, as you have tried as as David mentioned about Arlie Burke, have made the arguments interesting, uh, that you have explored those areas and have had a thorough vetting of your position. Um, and in the uh, society and in the system in, with, in which we work, uh, when the civilian authority makes a decision, that's it. Um, I think you can't go in superficially. Uh, you have to have thought the problem through yourself, uh, but uh, when the decision is made, that's it. If it, if at some point it uh, is contrary to your your sense of honor or your ethics, uh, then at that time you have other options. I mean, at, at one point, at least one point, Admiral Burke basically went over the heads of others in the military to make a point to civilian authority, and as Eisenhower took him aside and said, "Don't, don't do that again." But uh, is that is that? Can you imagine a circumstance in which you're a senior military officer, military officers more senior to you have basically gone along with the president, and you say, "Well, no, 
uh, under what circumstances might you do that? And what, what, what well, you talked about honor and ethics, but can you be a little bit more uh, uh, specific about a moment in which you think the, the, your senior military officers have just got it wrong or aren't challenging? Yeah. Uh, not to, uh, uh, to, to dodge. I mean, I, I, I think it has to be driven by the circumstances that you're in, the issue that you're dealing with, and, and, and the receptivity of your arguments as you put them forth, and then, and then you as an individual have to make that decision. Uh, and, and I do not believe that anything fits a mold uh, because of the many facets of every issue and the, and the complex uh, nature of what we're dealing with. Let me ask you just one more question along this line. What do you tell your, your subordinates about this? Do you, do you discuss this together when you're with senior admirals and, and talk about the limits of dissent? And are these conversations that happen at the highest level? And what the, do you say to them? I, I think that it's very, very clear um, that the, that the uh, expectations of civilian control of the military is, is, is unquestioned. Uh, I think everyone that is subordinate to me understands uh, the strength of my convictions in that regard. Uh, I do believe it is important as a senior uh, that you foster the opportunities for your subordinates uh, to feel comfortable and free in having the open discussions uh, as opposed to having been held in check and then trying to release everything at the final moment. Uh, and I think that, that in, in the ability to have that organization comfortable coming forward, uh, that, that there is an expectation that opinions can be offered, positions can be taken, um, and, and I think that, uh, that that is for the, the best of the institution. Admiral Rondau, you are actually a teacher by, uh, Admiral Rondau is the president of the National Defense University. What, what do you teach about this whole obligation or duty or limitation on speaking truth to power, so to speak? Let's bring Burke as our example to the answer to the question. Burke was absolutely able to constantly reframe the problem or reframe his mind around a new problem. And so the, the notion of strategic reframing is an intellectual pre -dis position that either you have or that you learn. And so what we do at, at NDU or what any of the defense education entities seek to do is to help us to reframe out from where we have been to something more that, that, that we should be thinking about. And so what Burke was able to do and what we seek to do in the spirit of Burke is constantly seek to reframe mindsets and mindfulness about the issues that are in front of us. What Burke was able to do was be comfortable thinking eight to 10, 20 years out, we seek to do that as, as well. But it's, it's, it's about setting a mindset and a mindfulness about what you are in and the environment. <coughs> if, if I might say though, in uh, echoing also the chairman and the CNO, Eisenhower was a leader who also knew what he had. And so the, respect, the respecting of the mind and of the leaders who are, who are subordinate to you is also part of this. So Burke was, was allowed to be Burke. And, what of, and one of the key things that, that we seek to teach is to be respectful of the intellect of those who are junior to you because they may indeed have, have, have an insight or a reframing that you do not have. And so every good leader would seek that. But we seek to, to reframe and, and to teach the ability to be uh, comfortable in a different environment. Uh, Senator, uh, you've been watching this balance for a long time. Uh, talk to us a little bit as you've watched it over the years, whether you think the, the modern military has the balance right on its willingness to challenge the civilian authority or to challenge even within the military their own superiors. Do you, What's well, your sense of the, how that balance is uh, Let's step back 41 years when I was privileged to be in the Pentagon in the Navy Secretariat. Uh, Melvin Laird was Secretary and Dave Packard was Deputy Secretary. And we used to get in the rooms with the Chiefs and Laird would always start, all right, let's take off the stars and bars and let's just have at it and listen to one another. I want to know your opinion. That's the same way I was privileged and I say with a deep sense of humility to 
Peace Secretary of the Navy, I always asked everybody for their view. But maybe I could like to return to your first question to the Chief and partially answered over here. But first to you, David Abshar. Well done. We'll say in the Navy, attaboy. <laughs> but you know, as long as I've known you, you've made one mistake in life. Rather than West Point, you should have gone to Annapolis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back these many years. I, I was uh, gone to the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And I'd met Burke. Burke had a, a protocol. Uh, he would, when you joined the Navy Secretary, it would come a time he'd send a little note. Now it's time I'd like to meet you. And you'd go over and see him in his home and his lovely wife. And uh, that's where I first got to know him. But we're out on the Sixth Fleet. So I did a little research. My aide at that time, wonderful man, was Tom Hayward. He later became Chief of Naval Operations. But this one incident might have cost him that. I found that the ship that Burke had in his squadron was still a part of our active fleet. So I went aboard her. We had a little breeches buoy that transferred me from cruiser over to the ship. And as a custom, I always went down to the engine room as a part of any business board operating ship. And uh, I was just with the senior chief down there. There was no chief petty officer boiler man down there operating that steam plant. I said, do you think you could drive this thing at 41, I mean 31 knots like Burke? He looked at me. He looked at the other chief. He said, you betcha, you know what? I said, crank it up. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, uh, I usually take my orders from the captain, but you're the secretary? Civilian authority controls. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> and for those of us who've been aboard ship, there's an exhilaration of when that steam plant throws full thrust to the screws and that rotating powertrain, the ship trembles. So I thought I'd better get back up to the bridge because it's going to be a little consternation. <laughs> so I got up to the bridge and I'd had this program uh, that I knew where Burke was. And I called him from the bridge. The captain of the ship's there and Hayward standing there. I got him on the phone thinking he'd be just exhilarated to know that his ship. I said, Admiral, she's right at 31 knots right now. And ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you the response, but it was a verbal keel hauling. <laughs> I mean, he dressed me down. I turned to the captain, said, the Admiral says, bring her back. <laughs> and uh, in later years, we met and uh, had a wonderful relationship. I'm deeply humbled to, to join this distinguished panel and all others today. Truly uh, someone who's idolized to this day by anyone who's fortunate enough to wear the Navy uniform. Uh, Admiral Mullen, let, let me ask you a history question. Do you, when you talk to your colleagues about uh, these difficult issues about dealing with civilian authority and how far you can go, do you talk about history? Do you talk about Admiral Burke? Do you talk about how it was done in past wars? Is it, are you informed by history? Um, I think I'm informed by history, probably for me, more recently than uh, than those times. Um, when I actually was, uh, much to my surprise, selected to be the CNO, I did some research then uh, on Admiral Burke, and I was uh, actually uh, stunned that in just that period of time, his time as CNO, which I recall was six years, um, longest serving, uh, and uh, what he was able to accomplish. And I, it was one of those things I looked at that and uh, I was wondering how I was going to even come close to matching up to anything like that, to be able to accomplish so much in that period of time. Uh, and I use that, I use it from that standpoint. Um, from the civilian control piece, I'm, I guess I'm much more um, driven and informed uh, by current times. Uh, and by current times, I'd say uh, the last 20 years or so. And uh, you know, my goal as a leader is to, to be uh, strictly apolitical, strictly neutral. And uh, the, in, in fact, the, the State of the Union earlier this week, I've had, you know, many 
uh, many uh, comments uh, since that about uh, you know the chiefs when we stand up, when we don't stand right. up in the in the aftermath of of the the president's speech and uh, and uh, but but the goal there really literally is to certainly uh, respond in a way that is supportive of those national security and military issues, but other than that, stay completely neutral in that. And so amongst my colleagues, and actually with my juniors, I do talk a lot uh, about the need to stay, uh, uh, be completely apolitical. And where that has, where that is different from Burke's time, I think, is uh, in, though in, in the situation where the, there is uh, the seeking of news, the vast exposure to media, certainly in the media is, you know, is always looking for, for the kinds of differentials to, to in many cases, sharpen issues. Um, but where I think uh, it, it has gotten uh, out of bounds is, quite frankly, is when we take the uniform off. Uh, and uh, there's tension between uh, those who uh, have worn the uniform all, their whole life and then they uh, they, uh, they take it off, and there's tension between free speech, which is nothing that I certainly would ever take on. Uh, but uh, I think in ways it can be uh, very difficult to understand. Certainly, uh, I, I frame a lot of this uh, from the, in terms of the farmer in Peoria who's really talking on the news cycle or who's writing because, generally speaking, they're still called admiral or general uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, that we're training in that regard, many of our young officers in particular, but not exclusively, uh, that, uh, that it's, uh, it's okay to speak up and it's okay to disagree publicly and constantly. And I, I worry a great deal about that in terms of uh, the apolitical position that the military is in. And so, and actually one of the things I've asked Admiral Ron Doe to, to, to do is address this issue. Uh, actually, all the war in all the war colleges to our young ones, because I think we do need to make sure we have it right. And uh, um, because you're both encouraging them to speak up at the same time, saying, "Watch it." But they have to they have to do it correctly, and and they really the the treasure here is the apolitical military, and it is, in my view, what we have to I think ensure uh, we guard and retain uh, at almost at, at all costs in this democracy. And it goes back to who we are, who we work for. Uh, it, very clear civilian control, and when and and when, as as I think Admiral Ruffhead said, you know, when we disagree and it gets to a point of ethics or morals, or, or when we actually are working for somebody and they don't have confidence in us, then it's then, then our only choice uh, isn't to speak up. It quite frankly is to move on. Let me ask you more specifically, and you've been asked about this before, but, but the most recent example of this when it got into the news was General McChrystal's sure. statements. Just, sure. How do you think he handled that? Well, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't want to. <laughs> 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 how do you think he handled it? <laughs> Actually, pretty well. Yeah. Um, it was uh, you know, very difficult position, uh, obviously very early in his Tour uh, in in what was uh, certainly, if not then, but rapidly becoming the most visible four-star position in the United States military, uh, and it was one that was made much more challenging because it was it was public. Um, and, and actually, one of the things, and this is part of uh, us growing as an institution, growing as uh, both uh, as an individual, and, and General Chris and I talked a long time about uh, moving into the four-star realm. It's different, and then he was going to do it on the world stage, and that's a real challenge. So, uh, uh, you know, all in all, I thought he did handle it well. Uh, it was a very, very difficult, it made the, uh, the challenge of the review uh, that much uh, more difficult, and certainly I would have preferred to not do it as publicly as, it, as, uh, as we did, and we all learned a lot in that regard, and certainly I would hope that, you know, in further strategic reviews, we can avoid that particular model. <laughs> Uh, Admiral, let me ask you a question about the, the Navy in particular. Uh, by tradition, captain of a ship has tremendous authority. Uh, the old days, complete authority because there was no communication. Uh, but even today, where you can talk to, uh, there is a tradition of a captain of a ship having all this authority. And yet, when he gets on land, he's got to learn how to 
Uh, he's not, not admiral. You can't put, like Nelson, putting his spyglass up and saying, I really cannot see the signal. Uh, how do you balance uh, this, this tradition of authority and command authority on a ship with uh, deference to civilian authority? What do you, what do you tell your captain? Okay. Well, as you pointed out, one of my favorite Burke quotes, and I identify with it a great deal, is uh, you do have the autonomy on a ship. And as he pointed out, going to sea used to be fun, and then they gave us radios. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think that uh, that even translates up in our current uh, connectivity that we enjoy. But I think uh, for me, and one of the great things about our Navy, and something that I place tremendous value upon uh, with all who serve and wear this uniform, uh, and Burke articulated this himself, and that the Navy is a culture of command. It is not a culture of staff. And, and that simple concept makes us who we are. Um, the willingness to step forward uh, when something needs to be done, the willingness to accept accountability, uh, which is oftentimes judged to be a bit extreme in the Navy, but that is what our culture is. Uh, and I find that that culture of command translates ashore as well, uh, because it is about the willingness uh, to take on the hard things, the willingness to lead, and most importantly, when things are good or bad, you accept the accountability. And, and so I do not see a distinction. I see it as a great strength of this service, and I am extraordinarily proud of the men and women who live that culture. Uh, Senator, let me go back and ask you this question again, because you've been you're, you're in a position of having observed this for a long time, from a, from a wonderful pers perspective, uh, where you're dealing with the, with the military. Do you think that there's any evolution here, for better or for worse, on military willingness to stand up to civilian authority, either good or bad, in that direction, or is it a, is it a fairly even progression? Uh, I found that the particularly the individuals in the military that get the flag rank in the Navy or the general rank in the Army. They know at that time to accept a special responsibility and be very candid. Throughout my career in 30 years in the Senate, I had, of course, on the Armed Services Committee, regular contact with the senior officers. And I always had a policy very often to leave the aides in the ante room and just sit with that officer, with none of my own staff, and just exchange views. I found it very productive, and I'm sure I've had it with you, and I've had it with you in my office uh, on that basis. By the way, I remember when you came up to CNO, I asked you, when I was Navy Secretary, did we ever meet? And you rather defiantly said no. <laughs> and uh, you said, you added this. You said, I was a Lieutenant a JG, I was on the gun line, this was during the Vietnam War. He said, I did everything I could. Never get to the earring. I never wanted to go there. Well, what goes around <laughs> comes around. You own it now. <laughs> but Evan, I, I got to tell you, the American citizens should be grateful for the young men and women who all volunteer now and come up into these ranks and work their way up and give their lives and their career together with their families. And when they get there, it's always been my experience, whether it's been in the Senate for the five years I was in the Navy Secretary, they shot straight with you. Admiral Rondeau, well, let me ask you uh, this, really the same question. Do you see any evolution here of the military getting more or less willing uh, to stand up to or to challenge, for, again, for better or worse, uh, civilian authority? Is there any I, trend? I think that the question is framed interestingly because it, it's at the edge, it is at the edge. I think that young people or older people, I think that what determines the leader uh, who can do this responsibly is the one who's intellectually curious and the one who is able to ask questions of him or her, herself and of their environment. So this is not at some edge of, of the, the first act. You go about your, your professional life and you ask questions, you try to understand, you try to analyze, and at some point you come to, a, to an aggregation point where, where you would say this does not make sense or this is a better way. 
and you come to that in an analytical, mature, professional manner. Then by that time you also have understood where you are on point. Then you go through the chain and you bring it up to your leadership. And usually the leaders are going to let you air that because you've thought it through and you've done a very good job at that. So our job is when we're educators is to try to help the individual officer or sailor or airman, soldier, um, marine to get there so that they can come to an analytical understanding of what's going on. Once you do that, your boss, your leader is going to be grateful. And for the most part, they're going to let you, they, they will help you carry the right argument. They may even help you to shape it better so that it will be successfully um, argued. So in my mind, this is not, not uh, about the edge point of when you must take on somebody at some point of, of adversary. It's about being compelling and good and competent and coherent so that everybody else is then compelled. This was Bert's gift, and this is the gift of good leaders, is to be able to do that and know where you are intellectually. So the intellectual curiosity of a young person today is to understand. Their access to information is, is without precedence. Our job as leaders is, is to help them get there so that they feel as though they're being heard, so that we are listening. So this is about a conversation and not just about being at the edge of being the adversary. If that is happening, and it happens every day, then you have a really healthy military and a healthy environment. Could I add a point? You bet. These fine officers are managers, but bottom line, they're all commanders. And foremost in their minds at all times is the fact that they're responsible for the life and the limb of those in the ranks. Their decisions put them in harm's way. Their decisions direct them to perform those duties. Now that's a special burden that none of us in private life or politics or business or whatever. We don't have that on our conscience. That's why I always feel they give it their best. Amen to that. Let's take a question from the uh, audience. David, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Yeah. All right, let's take it. Anybody want to ask a question? There's their mics there. Just uh, stand up to it. Now's the time. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question for Admiral Ruffhead. This experience in Haiti with the military uh, going in and offering relief, have there been any lessons that we've learned from it in the future on how we might be able to get about that faster? Well, I think there, there are. Um, it, as you may recall, um, there have been a couple of responses similar to this. The tsunami of 2004 uh, in the Pacific, uh, the, Indian, uh, the uh, earthquake in Pakistan, and, and so we're always looking at how we can do this better. Uh, and at the end of, uh, uh, of the experience in Haiti, whenever that may be, uh, we will have learned much from uh, res how we respond, how we stage, uh, the types of, of, uh, of skills and equipment that we may need. And, and I think that's one of the great things about not just humanitarian relief or anything else, that, that the, the military has a wonderful culture of learning from our past and from our mistakes. And we are willing to expose uh, things that perhaps weren't done as well as we would have liked and analyzing why uh, that happened and how we can be better. Uh, we are constantly renewing and, and re-examining ourselves. Any thoughts so far as to what you might change? Um, I think uh, that uh, the, um, um, one of the things that has been very important to me and what we've been working on for several years post-tsunami is, is the continued integration of non-governmental organizations and our military forces and other agencies. Uh, we have come a long way. I, I think that we have to continue to work on that because when you pitch into one of these uh, relief operations of this magnitude, uh, it is not one entity that will uh, pull the whole thing off. It's the integration of that. 
I uh, see Dick Solomon here. We've been working very closely with his organization, uh, and I think there are going to be a lot of uh, opportunities there to continue uh, to develop those types of relationships and, and protocols that allow, allow us to come together uh, more quickly. Thank you. Me, Thank you. It, it, yeah. can, I, can I just comment? I I'm, uh, uh, have been um, both intimately involved and um, I think the response has been remarkable given the, one, the suddenness of it, uh, two, the scope of it, um, and the ability for us to both muster resources and get them there um, in, the, in, the, in the mass that is required as opposed to the individual piece. Uh, and, and I did, I thought some of the most remarkable stories were some of the rescue units. I mean, there was a rescue unit from uh, China, which got there in 33 hours, out of Beijing. The Israeli hospital that got there. Um, um, uh, and, and all of those are really an important part of this. But, and we had units, you know, we had, uh, our Coast Guard was magnificent, literally, as uh, as the uh, right after the earthquake, uh, it is. It, however, it it has taken much more than that to get uh, some structure in place to be able to handle the scope and the volume uh, of the tragedy. Um, and it really has come in many ways as a result of uh, our our assistance in Indonesia and Pakistan, uh, even Katrina here, where you couldn't get there fast enough. Even there, you never can in these. Uh, and, and yet, and I'll just use an example, the Comfort, uh, which uh, got there in record time. You can't, you can't beam a thousand foot ship in, you know, with all its people. You'd like to be able to do that, but, it, but still, based on previous experience, Comfort got there in record time, and look what she's doing now. And that's just one example, getting the other forces on the ground. So. We, cl we clearly will learn, and we're much better than we were. Uh, but from my perspective, the response has been magnificent from NGOs, USAID, from our government, and from many other countries as well, in addition to the men and women in the military. Sir. Hi, I'm Al Pesson from Voice of America. I have a question for Admiral Mullen uh, uh, on this theme of leadership and what you consider as you chart a course uh, in, in a complex situation towards a destination that's been determined by the commander-in-chief, uh, what sort of factors you have to consider. And I'll, I'll give you two to talk about. One is don't ask, don't tell. And the other is uh, relations with China, because the Taiwan arms sale just announced the last couple of hours. So how do you try to balance you know, this commitment to Taiwan and a decision is made, but the imperative of remaining engaged with China? But now that I've talked about China, don't forget about the first point that I made. <laughs> um, I'd actually be happy to answer the second question. I'll answer the first question Tuesday at the hearing. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. Uh, the, the, the issue from a, from a leadership perspective with China, I think, is one that I have, I and others, have responsibility from a military to military uh, uh, perspective. And uh, opportunities, as has been the case with many, many countries. I actually find it a little bit ironic that we're talking about Admiral Burke, who put the Polaris program in place, uh, and I literally last week was in Moscow in negotiations with my counterpart uh, with respect to the START follow-on treaty, uh, which, which has an awful lot to do with the vision that he had, even though he didn't win all of that, uh, which speaks to decisions that we make and how long they last. Sometimes we think of them in the short term. So I actually try to think about how I handle myself and approach this from the long-term perspective. You're here in, after you're here in Washington a while, at least there is an opportunity to look out more than just tomorrow. And what does it mean? And the reason I bring that up uh, in China, and particularly on the mill to mill, because my thoughts are very much not anywhere, not, not even close to just the senior leadership perspective because I really want our younger officers to meet each other because that's the future. That's going to be the relationship. That's what we lost more than anything else in Pakistan when we sanctioned them for 12 years is those mid-grade officers who are now generals that don't know anything about the United States. And so I always have that in mind even in the discussion earlier in terms of uh, both accountability and uh, uh, being a political 
uh, I, half of my mind goes to our young ones so that in the long run that change can be made and I feel that way with China. And I'll, I'll uh, save Tuesday, Tuesday's answers for Tuesday on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I certainly recognize the question and I, and I understand uh, that this issue is moving very rapidly. Thank you. Evan? I'd like to make a comment, then I think maybe John should wrap us up the hours yeah. come in this marvelous uh, session here. You know, I, I think what so overarches the civilian military, and Burke understood this, is the power of ideas. Yeah. And I'm going to take two examples. One, John, with my naval hat, we're not going to Annapolis because I served on the more than Naval War College, and uh, then my Army hat with a visit, long visit I had privately with David Petraeus last week. But you know, here are two cases of a whole change of strategic tactical doctrine, one by the pen and ink sailor that Bupers constantly tried to sink as he, he went to history, Petraeus went to the lessons of Iraq. Both learned. Both got their acolytes. Uh, David Petraeus described this, how they got the buy-in, the, the puzzle they put together. Uh, out at Leavenworth, I remember I once I mentioned the White House that Petraeus was at, at Leavenworth. They ought to bring him back. He said, you know, in the penitentiary? I said, no, he's at the <laughs> Jim Staff School out there. And, uh, uh, so I won't say who said that in the White House now. It's the last administration. But uh, the, that, that Mahan uh, got his acolytes, T.R. Roosevelt, who then became assistant secretary, but before that he was going up to Naval War College, uh, the chairman of the, the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, John Hay became secretary of state, uh, Elliot Root, and they, when they came then to Washington, there was a whole strategic vision in the move into the Pacific. And the only reason, the only thing we had prepared in World War I with the Navy to support the Army over there was due to one, this one guy and his thought process and the acolyte. Petraeus did the same. And, you know, they, they changed a mindset in the way you fight in asymmetrical war. And I, I told him, you know, this is very similar, very different than my, and then when you get into this, it blurs civilian military. People are moving forward on, on ideas and, and, and doctrine. And of course, the other thing that I've already said, I've said this in my last book, this civ civilian, George Marshall, great Secretary of State, as well as Defense, and and the, our national security advisor, uh, this mix is good, this military experience mixed with civilian. State Department's learn to appreciate that. And we need engineers, former four stars in USAID today and so forth. So, but I, I think this has been a, been a wonderful uh, uh, session and, and it re really, we're, we're indebted to, to all of you. John, here, so we, I think we better uh, wrap, it up here. wrap it, wrap it up, wrap it up, and and but but I I really thank <laughs> you all for being with us and echoing the one and only Admiral Arlie Burke. Thank you very thank much. You much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd love to just get together and have lunch sometime if you'd like to do that. Thanks, everybody. And I'll have my folks. Uh,